Okay, so question number one. Please introduce yourself and your anti-bullying organization. My name is Lowell Levine, and the foundation is a 501c3 registered with the Eternal Revenue Service, the tax exempt, called Stop Bullying Now Foundation, Inc. Okay, um, question number two. Uh, please explain how your organization addresses the bullying problem and why you think the methods used by your organization are effective in reducing bullying. The message that we have that's been very successful in the four years that we've been active is called Educate Bullying Awareness. We have a program for the children and we have a program for the adults or the parents and grandparents. And we specifically speak to them about everything there is to know about a bully and everything there is to know about bullying. Plus, we help them on a uh, parent advocate basis on a one-to-one -one with the school if they need any help. So we're a really a two-fold operation. We teach everything there is to know about bullying to children and parents, and we also help the parents and the child one-on-one -on -one with the uh, school administrators to eliminate the problem. Okay. Uh, number three, uh, please explain the economic model that allows your organization to function. We uh, specifically work on contributions. We try to reach out to uh, corporations, wealthy individuals, private foundations to be able to support our effort because what we do with the money we raise, we use it for branding and visibility. The more people that know about our foundation, the more parents and grandparents contact us for immediate help for their child or grandchild. We do not charge the parents for any of our work because we depend upon contributions from different organizations that will respect and understand the work that we do. Okay, getting into things now. Uh, do you think that we as a society need to address the public mentality surrounding the bullying issue? And I'll give you a couple examples. Like when people say, well, it's just kids being kids, or it's part of growing up, or they need to learn to deal with their own problems, or it's not that bad, or they just need to stop being so sensitive. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, bullying today in 2016 is not the same it was in 1960. I use it as an example, even though bullying has been around since the beginning of time. Back in those days, Bullying was more like teasing, horsing around, boys will be boys and girls will be girls. Today, because of the internet and because of the mental illness of children, bullying has become a deadly epidemic. And that is why the federal government has classified bullying as the silent epidemic and the number one death among children K through 12 in this country. It has overtaken uh, children dying from accidents or children dying from diseases. So if you look at the figures, you will see of the 60 million children that attend K through 12 public, private, or home school in this country, almost 50% of them face some form of bullying, harassment, abuse, and discrimination. Well said. Um, and do you think that people in general have been desensitized to the bullying epidemic? Well, people in general, unfortunately, do not understand the uh, severity of the bullying problem. And there are too many parents out there who don't take it seriously with their own child and they feel that it's going to go away by itself or 
die out over a period of time. And in order to um, become successful in handling a child being bullied, the parent or the parent advocate or both of them working together must be assertive in their methods to reach the school administrators to show them that they are uh, lackadaisical in doing what they're doing and they have to come on much stronger. Having said that, there is a reason why in the state of Florida, I'm not familiar with the other states, that the governors have signed new anti-bullying laws, making it more like a civil rights discrimination. Uh, and we have that here in Florida, signed by the Governor Scott. And President Obama signed into law a couple of years ago a bill introduced to him through the Senate and the House, where if a child is being badly bullied, and the parents are complaining to the school system to take care of it, do things to rectify it, and if nothing has been done over a reasonable amount of time and the child takes their life because no one's helping them, it could be classified as a hate crime, civil rights violation, and the administrators could be brought up on accessory to murder charges. So to answer your question, it's not taken as seriously as it should, but it should be, and the more information is given out to parents and adults, it will be taken more seriously as time goes on. Okay. Um, number five. Uh, do the schools in general have a constructive attitude towards reducing the bullying problem, and what practices do you think the schools should adopt in reducing bullying, and why? School systems in this country a majority of them are failing with the bullying and school violence program. They all claim to have a zero tolerance program, but there's no such thing. They're not educated or trained to handle a problem of bullying because the money is not there. There are no mental health counselors on school campuses to help the child who's a bully or being bullied. And the problem is that the teachers and the administrators are into a certain category. They're lazy on the program, and they are more concerned about the image of the school, and they're more concerned about the job that they have because they don't want to be put in a position where they will lose their job. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are no strong anti-bullying programs in any of the school districts. They do have safe school departments, but the people working there are not trained at all, and uh, they're really not doing what should be done. Basically, what they do is put empty mailboxes outside of all the classrooms, so if a child is being bullied, they'll tell them to write a note and put it in there. But once they get the note, they really don't know really what to do to eliminate the problem. If the school systems followed my program, it will help dramatically, but unfortunately, they feel they can handle on their own, and unfortunately, based on the statistics of 214 to 215, they are failing. Okay. What are the biggest challenges you face in your work in effectively reducing bullying? Communicating with the schools. For example, I live here, my headquarters, and I'm one of the top three in the country, is in Palm Beach County, and the school superintendent and the administrators will not let me go into the schools to talk to the administrators, to explain to them and to teach them how to handle a problem or go into some of the classrooms to talk to the students. They feel they have it under their own control, and they feel they have their own program. And their program, unfortunately, is failing. And that's why parents, when I go to make speeches to boys and girls clubs, business, uh, networking groups or churches or synagogues, they're complaining to me that their child is being bullied, harassed, or uh, discriminated against, and the school is not doing anything to rectify the problem. So therefore, my biggest problem is educating the administrators on how to handle the problem, and they don't want to give in to that, and that's a big, big mistake. Okay. 
Um, how do you know that you have effectively resolved a bullying issue? psychological and neurological impact of being severely bullied and do you think that those consequences of being bullied can affect a person long into their adult life? The problem with children being bullied is being psychologically damaged and they're afraid and what happens is there's a new uh, staff that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, I've been asked to be part of it but it's very difficult. What it is is that they're trying to figure out how many free people commit suicide in their 30s and they're relating that suicide from when they were bullied in their teens early or in middle school. Because my next door neighbor, I didn't know, her son committed suicide in California uh, when he was 34 and they contributed to bullying when he was younger in K through 12 and he couldn't get over it. So that's a major problem. The other one is I always recommend to parents that their child should seek help with a licensed mental health counselor to talk out their problems and to bring it to a head where they could feel more comfortable in dealing with their personal life as they get older. I help them as a mentor but if they want to go to a professional licensed mental health counselor, I promote that as well. Some of them do it on their own, and some of them I have to uh, find one for them. And if they're living in poverty, based on the contributions we get, we help pay for the mental health counselor. Okay, number nine. Um, please explain the consequences and impact a bullying to society as a whole, economically and sociologically? Well, bullying has a major effect on the local community. If you're living in a town with one school, uh, elementary, one middle school, and one high school, and you have a child that is badly bullied or discriminated against, uh, like I have right now in a very small town in Colorado, where a parent called me a couple of days ago and said their child is being bullied and discriminated against not only by the students but by teachers because we're Asian and there's no Asians that live in this town. It's predominantly uh, Hispanic, over 80%. So I recommend to move out of the area, but they told me that he and his wife are disabled and they're poor and they just can't do it. So it does have an effect on the child psychologically and it has a long range effect. But the stronger ones who follow my program get out of it and they become leaders and they help other children who are being bullied because they went through it and they understand the consequences and the seriousness of it and they're able to guide and help other children. And uh, that's a program that the schools don't let me come in to explain. So, that's what I do with the individuals one-on-one, -on -one. and it has a major impact on the town because if a child commits suicide in a small town, everybody knows everybody by personal names because the town may only have a few thousand people, but it has an effect 
on them because a child is dead who they know the parents. And and it must also have uh, an impact on the economy as as there's a, a more of a demand for for uh, uh, health health professionals and, and and this type of thing and 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 people who could have been doctors or 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 gone into professions end up being like high school dropouts this type of thing right that's absolutely true because if more and more children are recognized with the problem and they go and get seek help with a licensed mental health counselor, it gives the licensed mental health counselor more opportunity to have uh, patients. And maybe that health, that a health counselor may do what I do, recommend that child to volunteer in a local community uh, church or a synagogue or a hospital or maybe that child to go out and get themselves a part-time job after school on the weekends so that they, their mind is more clearer and they don't feel that they're being in a house or in a room by themselves, no friends, or no, but nothing to do, and they're became, becoming more creative. Some of those children who would not normally go to college may want to go to a community college just to feel what they may want to pursue in their life, and some of them wind up going forward in their college degree where they wouldn't normally go to college because they want to better themselves, and they may want to better the community and they think they may want to become uh, an interior designer. They may want to become a nurse because they want to help other people that are not getting the proper help in hospitals or in, or in nursing homes. So it does have a positive effect in the community with those type of children that could go forward if they have the right uh, advisors and the right mentors. Okay, number 10. Um, what factors do you think contributes to the development of a bully? Okay, bullies, uh, it has been determined that bullies, unfortunately, the majority of them are mentally ill children and they became mentally ill from the time they were born because my opinion is, based on the parents of the bullies I've spoken to, they shouldn't have had children. They have, these children have been abused, they have been downgraded from the time they were born all the way into when they start school. And the only way they feel that they can get out of their mental depression and mental problems is controlling somebody else who may be shorter, weaker, dumber, uglier than they are. So it has nothing to do with a male or a female. A lot of the bullies have been created at home because the first five or six years of their life, they're at home. And when they get to school, they are with other children, but they have that mental problems from being brought up. And the only way they can overtake their mental depression or mental balance is the controlling of other children. Do you think that part of the bullying problem is that some people don't recognize what bullying looks like or that they are a bully themselves? Absolutely. When I teach bullying to parents, I teach them the 10 or so red signs in their child to look for to see if there's something bothering them if they're being bullied. And like, uh, for example, if their grades are going down, if their eating habits are going down, if they don't want to uh, after school activities, if their dressing habits are poor, if they're watching more TV, if their personality is changing, they're getting angrier and angrier, their sleeping habits have changed, their dreams in screaming, crying in their sleep, don't want to go to school, faking illnesses, all these are red signs that there's something bothering your child and you have to explore it and find out what it is before it gets worse. As far as the bully is concerned, his attitude, his angry, mean attitude is a red sign that he has problems and he needs help. Unfortunately, if the parent has mental problems and needs help and not getting it, they're not going to get it for their child. And too many parents who have children that are bullies are living a life of denial. Okay, number 12. Um, to what degree do you think that passive bystanders contribute to the bullying problem? 
and wine. What should bystanders do? Bystanders should never ever confront the bully directly. And the reason for that is the statistics just came out that I saw that over 1,000 bystanders, children mostly, have confronted bullies and they have been either killed or they have been permanently brain damaged by the bully because the bully who's mentally ill doesn't want to give up the power and they don't want to be told what they do by another child. What I recommend they do is they must tell the principal, the teacher, the administrators of the school, but more importantly, they must tell their parents, either it's them or their friend, so their parents can step forward and be able to help their child or their friends or their child's friend. That's one of the reasons why my organization, we believe in branding and disability. The more parents that know of us through our ads in local community newspapers, the more people that we get to call us for help. And that's what we basically use the donations for besides helping the parents. We don't have overhead in our organization because we don't pay a landlord rent and we do not have employees on a payroll. So therefore, all the money that we raise goes to branding and visibility so we can help all these children and the bystanders know that if they tell somebody, hopefully something will be done to help rectify the problem. And, I mean, my, my, my thought to do with this is, is that, I mean, if, if the bystander is giving attention to the conflict, and if they're not protesting, then they're sort of giving a, a license to it. If the protester sees what's going on, and he's not taking the initiative to come forward and talk to a, an adult, to complain to an adult, or to explain to an adult what's going on, and he just lets it happen, he becomes part of the problem. That means he's associated with the bully. Right. Um, number 13, what treatment would you recommend for the bully, the bullied, and possibly the bystander, and why, and would it involve some form of restorative justice? Well, they all have to, if they're smart, they all should go to licensed mental counselors, like I explained before, who have the experience of working with uh, a children's crisis. And if they do that, hopefully they'll be able to open up to the licensed mental health counselor and the mental health counselors could possibly guide them. The other situation that I believe in, that I recommend, is that I, I do not believe in suspending a bully from school if he's caught bullying someone. I'm a strong believer in volunteer work in your local community. Whether you volunteer at a store or you volunteer at a hospital, or you volunteer at a synagogue or a church or with a political uh, person like a congressman working in his office, whatever it takes to keep your mind functioning in the right direction by doing that type of work. Otherwise, if you just continue doing what you're doing as a bully and go home and feel happy what you're doing, it's not going to eliminate you from being a bully. And the same thing with a person being bullied. They have to be able to talk it out with somebody, and they have to be able to be strong enough to build up their self-esteem and self-confidence so they can tell the bully, please don't bully me anymore, I'm past that stage. Two programs that I have children go into, and they are not being bullied anymore, one of them is the fear. I'm a strong believer that if a child has interest in singing, dancing, acting, or an instrument, when I put them into a theater, recommend them to go into a theater, they break out of the problem of being bullied because that helps build up their confidence and self-esteem and it's hard to be, uh, to be bullied. The other one is martial arts, not so much to use it against the bully, but to build up their own self-esteem in the martial arts by going from a blue belt to a black belt, to a green belt, it builds up their confidence as they're getting increased on um, their belt and, and getting increasing their ability to be able to do um, martial arts or karate. Okay. Um, 
Do you think that a bullying situation in a school can contribute to psychopathic behaviors in others who may not even be psychopathic against the bullied? In short, just how to, how out of control can a bullying situation become? Well, it could get out of control. I've seen situations where one person is a bully and he's got some friends and they join him. For example, if you go into a lunchroom and you see the child that's being bullied, he's told, don't eat lunch with them. We don't want to be with you. We don't want anything to do with you. Go home and kill yourself. And he's sitting by himself at another table. The bully probably has other kids who are friendly with him or know him or maybe afraid of him too, and they sit with the bully, hoping that by being friendly with the bully, the bully won't bother them. So a lot of these kids are weak in their thinking because they're afraid that if he's bullying this child, we don't want him to truly be, so let me be friendly with the bully so he doesn't pick on me or make me feel bad, so at least I got friends. Yeah, like weakness on their part, which hopefully they will overcome as they get older, but it's not a good thing to do. Yeah, like I remember from like back when I was in junior high, um, I was in res in, in wrestling in, in, in gym class and I accidentally broke a friend's arm and he wasn't very popular in school and after everybody found out that I accidentally broke his arm uh, students were actually congratulating me. Yeah, because they don't want you to break their arm. Or maybe they didn't like her either. I don't know, you know, depends upon the situation. Yeah, maybe just... they were happy that you know, maybe they didn't like her, or maybe they were afraid that if you did it to her, gee, maybe you'll do it to me next. I don't want my arm to be broken. So it's up to the individual. It depends what kind of guidance they get, what kind of uh, home life they have. Uh, and family support they have to be able to overcome that and to be strong enough to go forward in the right direction. So, uh, 14A, uh, which you may have addressed already, is have you come across bullying situations that have multiplied in the number of people involved in bullying the victim? Well, yeah, I, I've seen that where the start of, where, where I would talk to a child who's being bullied with his mother or her mother, and I say, well, how many children are, are, are bullying you? He says, well, it started four months ago with this young this boy, and then all of a sudden now it's three or four. I said, well, how did it go from one to three or four? And they tell me, well, they're his friends, and uh, they, uh, they they want to... Uh, uh, do what he's doing. I said, in other words, they are followers. And they said, yes, they're like followers and they just don't want to, they don't want to upset him, so therefore uh, they go along with him. So that shows me those kids who go along with the bully, they come from weak backgrounds or they're just weak children of their own. Number 15, um, what are some of the most devastating situations of bullying that you have personally come across? I would say uh, bullies taking kids and banging their head against a concrete wall. We had one recently, which I took out of school, being homeschooled. They thought he was permanently brain damaged, but luckily he wasn't bleeding internally. Uh, that's bad. Or a kid having his teeth knocked out or his eye closed because he's been punched and hurt. I would say the things that I see most of all is, uh, or the other one is, being knifed uh, in the back of the neck with a uh, pencil, with a pointed pencil. Uh, so I've seen those things. I've seen bruises. And uh, I would say uh, the physical end of it is very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. But it was it, w it was a question that had to be asked, you know. Yes. Um, no problem. That's part of the bullying situation. It becomes, it starts with verbal and then it leads to uh, physical. That's the difference between today and years ago. Uh, number 16, do you think the ideology and or attitudes of adolescents can contribute to a pro-bullying atmosphere? Uh, yeah, it, uh, if, if the child is brought up in a dysfunctional home where the parents are dysfunctional or divorced or fighting with each other all the time, uh, it may become a situation, it could become
got a situation where uh, uh, the bully learns from that, and they can't they can't get the help at home that they basically require to help them overcome it. So therefore, uh, a lot of it is from the house, and a lot of it is the uh, the child is uh, living in a household that is not good. That's why we get. That's why I'm speaking next week at the um, the place of hope. I'm um, speaking to 40 children that live there. Those 40 children were abused and degraded at home by their parents, and they were uh, taken out of their homes by the court, and they were put into the place of hope. So therefore, they asked me to come over and speak to these 40 children so I could and show them that they have a future ahead of them that's positive, and they have an opportunity to put aside their bad experiences learn from the bad experiences, and try to build on successes. Because they're young. Some of them are middle school, some of them are high school. Um, number 17, um, what are the most effective steps a person can take if they are being bullied? They, okay, the most, the, 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 the number one, they got to speak up. Okay. That's one out of four speak up. If they, when I teach them, I say to them, you've got to speak up. Even if you call me, if you call me, then I'll call your parents. But the point is that they speak up to the school, but they got to speak up to the parents. The parents got to be strong enough and assertive enough to make the appointment at the school with their child so they can, they can bring it out into the open. And I tell parents, if you want, I'll go with you as your parent advocate. So <clears throat> that's why the law was passed in Florida, civil rights law, that if a parent goes to the school to speak to the school about and the administrators about the problem and nothing's being done, they have a civil rights uh, application to accept a parent's parent advocate. They can't stop that advocate to come in. I have been stopped coming into the schools to work with the parents, but they can't do it anymore because the new law was passed by Governor Scott. Okay, number 18, um, do you think the greater responsibility in reducing bullying should be placed on the schools and or the parents of the students? Both. Both. Uh, the, parents, the parents have to find out first. They have to be strong enough and assertive enough to go forward to stop this. And then it's up to the school after that to take care of, their, uh, take care of the problem. Now, that's why the law was passed by President Obama. If a child is being bullied in school and the parents are trying to get the, 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 uh, the uh, bullying stopped, and if the school does not take the initiative to do it and the child commits suicide, the new law is now it becomes a federal hate law dash civil rights violation. <coughs> And the administrators who are trying to get this thing done and failed can be brought up on accessory to murder charges. Okay, just two more questions. Um, what can a person do to effectively reduce bullying in society aside from sharing their bullying story on social media? Yeah, can you hold on one second? For sure. Going, um, uh, yeah, just hold on. I'm in a parking lot and I want to talk to the police officer because I have to go somewhere, and this is a college campus. Okay. Okay, hold on. Just give That's all right. Um, what can yeah, well, it's, it's a huge college here, and uh, I'm going to a bowling conference, and uh, somebody from South Carolina is speaking, 
and uh, they invited me. So, uh, but to find, you know, the building was not going to be easy, but they just told me what to do. Okay, go ahead. Next question. Uh, what can a person do to effectively reduce bullying in society aside from sharing their own bullying story on social media? Well, the only way they can do it is by talking about it. Volunteering their services to speak to children at different organizations. Children's clubs, churches, synagogues, boys and girls clubs, wherever children are involved, if they can go in and they can discuss and they can talk about, and they can, and if they can talk about what they have experienced and how to handle it based on the way they handle it, they will be a big help. Okay, and 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 twenty. What if a person wanted to create their own anti-bullying organization, like in Canada, for example? How would they start to build their organization? They would have to, well, number one, they would have to put together the organization. I don't know how it works in, uh, I don't know how it works in, uh, in your country, but here we have to file for a 501c3 tax exempt to be able to do things like that. It's just for a form, an organization, a company, and then start to promote it as best they can and promote it into the local community, into the boys and girls clubs, into the, uh, uh, the corporations in the area, or into the um, uh, Chamber of Commerce if you have one, or different areas where they're able to get their name out, where they'll be invited to speak. And uh, now I'm giving you your oh, chance... Well, at, at schools as well. No. Okay. Uh, now I'm giving you your chance. If you have anything else that you wish to say about bullying in general or your organization, now's your opportunity to say so. Well, we're, uh, we're, we are the Stop Bullying Now Foundation. We are the, one of the top three in the entire country. We, our uh, program is Educate Bullying Awareness. And our goal, our mission is to educate children and parents about bullying, so they have a complete understanding what it's all about, uh, and and uh, we also teach them uh, what to do if they're being bullied or handle the school, and to be able to bring it to a head so it could be uh, eliminated from their child. And the second thing we have is our goal. Our goal is to save the life of a child from either suicide or the fear of going to school because of being badly bullied. And all monies that we raise or is contributed to our organization goes to branding and visibility to get our name out. We, For example, we recently received a nice check from Tampa, Florida. We put ads in the local newspapers there and we got phone calls from parents who didn't know who we were, who we're helping out. So it's the more people that know of us, the more calls we get, the more children we save. Right on. I know. I know. It's uh, it's been a tough interview, but I am so great. No I'm so grateful for your for your time and and very thankful. Not a problem. Not a problem. And um, thank you very much. For, thanks for calling me and thanks for interviewing me. I really appreciate. it. I appreciate your time just as much. I have all the time in the world when it comes to saving the life of a child and the destruction, save the destruction of the family. By the way, there's going to be another stat coming out in about three, four years. The government wants to know how many parents commit suicide within five years after they find out their child committed suicide because of bullying, and they feel guilty because they didn't do enough to help the situation. They weren't sort of enough, or they didn't call the right people. I do get calls from parents who lost children, but it's too late. But they do volunteer work. I, what I do is if they raise any money, I'll take an ad out of their local paper in memory of their child's name. Wow. All right. Yeah, it's it's a horrible problem, man. It's def it's definitely uh, a, a worldwide problem. <laughs> it's not only here in the United States, but you know we got three hundred twenty-two million people. You got thirty, thirty-one million, but it's also in Canada, Europe. It's all over. Like I was, I was. I thank you for, thank you for calling me. And I hope I was a good help. 
You you definitely were. Take Thank care. You. Appreciate it. Take care of yourself. Call me anytime.